Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today I would like to wrap up the part, the little part I did about modular representations. And one of the most important concepts in modular representation theory of finite groups is the local global principle. Um, whatever that is, so it's it's not the local global principle, it's more like a local global principle. Um, so kind of small determines big, we'll see what that means. And then I have a lot of conjectures in the end. Uh, which are partially proven and for partial classes or sometimes the run direction or something like that so it's pretty much still work in progress um turns out that group theory in non-modular case is pretty smooth pretty nice and then in the modular case it's just yeah hard let's just say it's hard so the idea uh a local global principle the local global principle anyway goes back to something quite unrelated uh but same idea so let's just do it. So global versus local or local versus global is really that you can determine locally what happens globally. Uh, if you know a global answer, you know a local answer. That's usually not so hard, but knowing a local answer should not necessarily, or in general certainly doesn't determine a global answer. And the first, at least historically speaking, and it's also where the name comes from. The first local global principle is in, well, let's say number theory. So um, it's called Hasse's local global principle. And it basically is the following. So you want to solve a Diophantine equation, something like x squared plus xy plus y squared equals zero. And you're not really interested in this. In, well, it's kind of a version of number theory. Going back to the old Greeks, the Ophantine equations, you are not really interested in real solution or complex solutions or something. You're really interested in integral solutions um, or over the rational numbers, which up to scaling is the same anyway. Um, but roughly, then the local global principle says the following. So there is some global. So the global solution is a solution over the integers, whatever, minus 4, 0, or whatever. Uh, so here, I think I get a solution by using 0, 0 for x and y. Um, in general, it's probably much harder, of course. Uh, but anyway, so this is a global solution. Uh, OK, fine. That's what we want. And the Hasse principle says that there should be local solutions, which are basically solutions mod p. Um, plus some stupid extra condition that I'm going to ignore anyway. So you have local solutions, which are really just solutions mod P. And if you have them for all mod P's, that makes sense. You can somehow can piece them together into a global solution. So when can local solutions be joined together into a global solution? Turns out that this is not always possible. It's only possible under certain circumstances. Um, so those obviously that there's no reason for it well maybe not obviously but there's certainly no reason for it to work right so why you should be able to determine something global by just looking at your little map here so in general this is just not working and it's kind of all, always the point of those local global principles to figure out um under what circumstances this actually works and it's the same for all the local global principles I'm going to show you uh, for modular representation theory in this video, which uh, where global and local, we'll see what that actually means. So global is basically the group and local is a subgroup. So here is an instance, uh, we'll see uh, in a second fully in details what this is, but the only thing I did is I used magma, which can run online. So code and everything is in the description and you can run it online yourself. The only thing that's happening here is I have the character table of the alternating group and I compute uh, the blocks for the second one. Uh, sorry, for the, for, for, for the first character. T1 is just the first character, it's a trivial character. So I compute the principal uh, block and characteristic two. Characteristic two for the alternating group, which is uh, a one times two times three times four times five over two uh, of size. So if I even if I get rid of the two here, um, so uh, there's still two still divides this order. So two is a bad prime if you want. And that's what it gets. So that's what I get. So the block here, the blocks look as follows. So this is a principal block and there's a trivial block. The defect of the block is two. The defect of the trivial block is zero. And the uh, defect group is Z mod two cross Z mod two in this case. For the first one, I don't care about the second block in this case. Okay, so what can, well, kind of um, some subgroup tell us about um, the defect group? And what you can do here is the following. Um, so basically, 
th this one itself has only one defect group, which is itself. So it seems like there is some information in this subgroup. So this is a subgroup of A5, actually. There's some information of this subgroup, which is way smaller than A5. This is of order four, and this is much bigger, as you can see. Somehow this little subgroup encodes already its defect group for the big one. So what can subgroups tell us about group representations, about defects and so on? And more precisely, what can P subgroups tell us about uh, those representations? There seems to be something going on. Obviously, in this example, it might just be a fluke, um, but we'll see that's actually not. And that's the local global principle. So a P subgroup, that's a local information, and it determines the global information, namely the defect groups of the big piece of the whole group. Um, so here's really how it works. So Brouwer's local global principle, kind of everything in modular representation theory at one point goes back to Brouwer, I guess. Um, and it works as follows. So I have my block here. It's really the same picture as before. And I have my defect group Z mod 2 cross Z mod 2. Um, and, oh, no, sorry, this is not the same picture as before. This is another example. This is the Hebrew group of order 6, but still blocks um in characteristic two and i should have spotted that it is not the same example because obviously the blocks are different but anyway so in this case i have um two non-trivial defect groups z2 cross z2 for the first one and z2 for the second one and it turns out that the kind of the same story is true so z2 cross z2 has only one defect group itself namely itself and same for z mod 2z and the in other words, Brouwer's local global principle is then a bijection between a global datum and a local datum as follows. So the blocks of G with defect group D, that's what I'm computing here. So I have a block of uh, G, which is the data group in this case, and it has defect group, whatever, this one or this one, is the same. So there's one-to-one -one correspondence between the blocks of the P group with the same defect group. Um, in this, so in general, there's a normalizer involved. In this case, the normalizer is boring. So in this case, it's really just um, you look at the corresponding P subgroup and look at its defect, and its defect will uh, determine the original defect, which is really a global local principle. Okay, I say it again: the global information, the the defects of G itself are encoded by local information by defects of P subgroups or strictly speaking of normalizers of these subgroups. So normalizers might get might get bigger in this example. And this is, by the way, in this example as well, the normalizer was just relatively boring. And then there, are, so Brouwer actually proved three main statements, which I don't want to, and I really can't right now, um, spell out precisely because it just takes us too far away. But basically they're all local global principles and they're all of the following form. So the Brouwer one theorem, so Brouwer theorem number one, is the one from before, which is clearly a local global principle, right? Global, uh, the group, local, a subgroup, and the subgroup determines something about the group. So that's a local global principle. Um, Brouwer 2 is roughly the same, but now you take a centralizer of an element, and that subgroup, again, determines uh, blocks of the group. And Brouwer 3 is basically a strength uh, or an alternative version of Brouwer 1, for the principal uh, block, for the principal block, you can say a little bit more. And all of these are, well, well, three is just one, if you want. All of these are then obviously local global principles. And it's kind of surprising that it works so nicely. So you can always say something about the group by looking at the subgroup. And that's really a non-trivial statement. Why should that work? Why should that work at all? The subgroup could be really, really much smaller. So imagine, for example, there's a P subgroup. So imagine, for example, uh, the order of the group has many, many prime divisors. So P to something, Q to something, what is the next prime? L is a good prime, M is a good prime, M is a perfect prime, and so on. So uh, the P subgroup somewhere sits here. So in general, it's just way, way smaller than the, than the group itself. And it still determines the behavior of the group. It's pretty cool. Um, so these are Brouwer's main theorems proven from roughly from the 40s to the 60s of the last century. Um, and it just, well, Brouwer's theorems kind of were kind of just the tip of the iceberg. And nowadays, most parts of modular representation theory are related to some versions of uh, local global principles. I just mentioned uh, the maybe the most well-known ones. So there's, again, the conjecture of Brouwer. 
Um, there's a McKay conjecture and there's Boris Abelian Diffin conjecture, and they're all kind of of the same type. There will be some subgroup involved, and the subgroup should determine uh, the big group. Okay, so this was kind of my wrap up about modular representation theory. As I said, the conjectures I just showed you, they are conjectures. They're mostly they're not known. There are some directions maybe known, they're known in special cases or something like that. But in general, they're still open. And modular representation theory is mostly nowadays about trying to figure out how to use those local, maybe I shouldn't say mostly, but uh, to a big part is about trying to figure out how those local global principles actually can be used to in the end determine the Brouwer characters or other information you would like to know about the modular representations of the group. Okay, so this was the last talk about modular representation theory. Uh, next time I will wrap up the whole representation theory series by showing you uh, the application I promised in uh, the first talk, actually. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.